Hello dear students and here we are together to dive into the second series of class 12 important question answers of history for your upcoming board exams. So the first chapter bricks, beads and bones we have already covered. Now we are moving on to the second chapter that is kings, farmers and towns. And in this series I have tried to provide my dear students with all the important questions which may come in your board exams and these are the questions which are being coming in the previous board exams as well. So let us begin. So coming on to question number one, describe the salient features of Mahajanpats. So Mahajanpats, what were they? They were the earliest states of India. Janpat is actually made up of two words, Jan and Pad. Jan means people and Pad means the food. So it refers to the place where the Aryans, they have settled. And Mahajanpats were these Janpats when they together, they combined and took, they took a big form. That big state came to be known as Mahajanpats. So now let us study about these Mahajanpats. So the first point, as per Buddhist and Jain texts, there were 16 Mahajanpats. The most important were Vaji, Magad, Koshala, Kuru, Panchal, Gandhar and Avanti. Second point, most of the Mahajanpats, they were ruled by kings, some known as Gana or Sang. Here, the power was shared by a number of men who were collectively known as Rajas. So here you should know what is the meaning of the word Gan or Sang, right? And some of the Mahajanpas, they were ruled by kings and some of them, they were oligarchy. Means you can find the primitive form of republic in those Mahajanpas. And example being is Vaji. And the example where the Mahajanpad which was ruled by a king is Magad. Each Mahajanpad had a capital city which was often fortified. Maintaining these fortified cities as well as providing for incipient armies and bureaucracies required resources. Rulers were advised to collect taxes and tribute from cultivators, traders and artisans. So collection of tax is in our history right from the ancient time and collection of the tax was completely legal as the kings, it was the responsibility of the king to work for the social welfare, to protect its subject and the subjects, they were supposed to pay the taxes for all the services which the king was offering them. Mahajanpats developed gradually a standing army and bureaucracy. Sometimes raids on neighboring states were conducting, were conducted for acquiring wealth and these raids were considered to be Legitimate means it was not wrong if you are raiding your neighboring state. Now moving on to second question, a very important question. Why is the 6th century BC often regarded as a major turning point in early Indian history? So this chapter, it is right from a 6th century BCE to 6th century CE, right? So these we are covering here. So why the 6th century BC is considered as one of the most important time in Indian history? So the first reason is use of iron, the coming up of coordinate system, the rise of Mahajanpats and the coming up of new forms of religions. Now coming on to use of iron. So this is the Iron Age, right? The period when Vedas were written down or we call the Vedic period. So this is the Iron Age civilization. And before Iron Age civilization was Indus Valley civilization, which was Bronze Age civilization. The use of iron became extensive and implements helped in clearing deep forest areas that increase the area of cultivation means tools like axe were made. Coinage, large scale use of coins which was essential for trade and commerce. The punch marked coins were the earliest coins of India and they were made up of uh, copper later on gold coins, silver coins they all came. Then Mahajanpats, rise of Mahajanpats like Magad, Koshala, Gandhar, Avanti, Kuru. And you can briefly write down about this Mahajanpats as we have discussed in question number one. Then the coming up of new forms of religions like Buddhism, Jainism and all. Now moving on to third question. Describe the economic and social conditions of people living in rural areas from 600 BCE to 600 CE. So the answer is, first of all we will be talking about the economic condition. So there were different ways. Alright, different ways. See. Agriculture was the mainstay of our economy. All right. So it was from farming that the entire, the most of the revenue was coming. So shift to plow agriculture, the first change. 
Second is plow share for the growth in agricultural productivity. Plow share was being used. The use of irrigation through wells and tanks and less commonly canals were also constructed. Moreover, in some parts of Ganga Valley, production of paddy was dramatically increased by the introduction of transplantation. Here I want to add that during the time of Indus Valley Civilization, we have found very few traces of rice. But now the rice plantation was carried on a large scale because we came to know about transplantation. Exchanges were felicitated by introduction of coinage. Silver and copper coins were used this time, by this time. Social conditions. There was a growing differentiation amongst people engaged in agriculture, landless agricultural laborers, small peasants, as well as large householders who were known as kehepatis. Landlords imposed large taxes on farmers or common people. Okay, and in order to pay the taxes, the farmers they were increasing their production. Women were not given independent access to resources like land, but we come across Prabhavati Gupta. She was the daughter of Chandragupta II or Chandragupta Vikramaditya. She had the access to land and that's why she made the land grant. So basically in this question, where we have to write down about the economic and social condition of the people. So economic is all related to farming. So we have to explain about farming here and definitely trade and coinage system which came up. And the social condition talks about like uh, how, what kind of relation was there between the people, the tax policy and the status of women. So many, there were many rights which were not given to women. It was a male dominating society, a patriarchal society, right? Women were not given any share in their uh, property, the, the property of their father. So all th such type of things were prevalent in ancient India. Why was James Princip's contribution considered as a historic development in Indian? Epigraphy. Again, a very important question. So, who was this James Princip? Let's talk about his post. So, he was an officer in the Mint of East India Company work. He was an epigraphist. Epigraphists are the people who read inscriptions, right? They decipher and they read inscription. And he deciphered Ashokan Brahmi script in 1838 and even Kharoshti. Both were deciphered by James Princip. Contribution. His contribution in the development of Indian epigraphy was that he was able to decipher Brahmi and Kharoshti scripts used in the earliest inscriptions and coins which were then used. And because of the, this great discovery of James Princip, we come to know so much about the Mahajanpats and Magath. Okay, especially the work that was done by great Ashok. His study of inscriptions gave a lot of information about the Rulers. Now here comes the next question. Mention any two ways of propagation of dham by Ashoka. This question came in the year 2017. To propagate dham, the following steps were taken by Ashoka. Dham basically refers to all the moral values, code of conduct which one needs to follow as per Ashoka. So that was an amalgamation of different religion. And here I would like to add that after the Battle of Kaleng, Ashoka. Uh, his life was completely transformed. After he saw the violence and the devastation brought by Kaling War, he decided not to be on the path of violence anymore. He became non-violent thereafter and then he propagated Dham. He came to uh, he came and he constructed few code, code of conduct and moral values, which are collectively known as Dham, and he adopted Buddhism thereafter. So the principles of dham were engraved in Prakrit. The language is Prakrit, which was written on rocks, pillars and caves so that people could read and follow them. Special officers, very important, please underline it. Special officers known as dham Muhammad, they were appointed to spread the message of dham. So here we get one more question that uh, who were these officers who were given the task of spreading dham? So they were dham Muhammad. He learned Buddhist scholars. He sent le learned Buddhist scholars to distant lands to spread Buddhism and even he has sent his own children Mahendra and uh, the daughter Sangamitra to Sri Lanka to spread Buddhism. He ordered the construction of both Buddhist monasteries including stupa for example Sachi stupa. So all this was done by Ashoka for spreading Dham and Buddhism. Now we have question number six on the screen. Discuss any three features of modern administration. Which of these elements are evident in the Ashokan inscriptions that you have studied? Talking about the modern inscription administration. 
so the first thing is that the entire uh, the modern empire it was very huge right okay so it expanded in almost entire northern part of indian subcontinent so in order to rule such a huge territory right five centers were chosen or five provinces so centers were carefully chosen both takshila and ujjaini being situated on important long distance trade routes then suvangiri literally the golden mountain which was important for tapping the gold mines of karnataka and then patliputra which was the capital now coming on to communication communication was along land as well as water routes which was very much important for the empire flow of information committee and subcommittee they were formed to run the administration and safety of boundaries so as per the book indica indica is the book which was written by megasthenes he has mentioned that there were one committee with six sub committees so these were so this is about the army and the defense forces so first looked after the navy second managed transport and provisions third was responsible for the foot soldiers infantry fourth for the horses fifth for chariots and sixth was for the elephants so you must write on all these six sub committees when you are talking about the records of megasthenes the activity of the second sub sub committee were many such as arranging for bullock carts to carry equipments and recruiting servants and artisans to look after the soldiers so much work was there for the second group ashokan inscriptions mention all the elements of this administrative system of the modern empire thus the features of administration are evident in the inscriptions of the ashokan age so through the inscriptions which are written on various rocks pillars caves stones rocks we come to know about the administration of mauryan so on the screen we have seventh question now describe the notions of kingship that developed in the post modern period post modern means um after mauryans okay so after mauryans guptas and kushanas they ruled india so what was this divine kingship theory in the post modern period the idea of kingship got associated with divine divine theory of state this is very important so now the kings they started getting legitimacy of their rule through divine kingship all right means they were trying to get some sort of connection with divine god monarchs were not talking about the divine sanction to rule the people legitimacy it is all about the social origin of shak who established kingdom in the north and northwest and satvahans ruled over central western india was ambiguous but once they acquired power they attempted to claim social status in a variety of ways so here we study about kushanas and guptas so kushanas they called themselves at devaputra it is believed that kushanas they came from central asia somewhere in china and they used to call they adopted this title of devaputra which means a godly status or right, a dev putra the son of the god they built large statues of themselves in temples to get divinity kushana rulers coin depict king kanishka on one side and a deity on the other probably suggesting that the king was god like so these were some of the steps taken by kings for the divine kingship gupta rulers another development of kingship is found during the gupta dynasty it was a period of large sized states such states were dependent on samans who sometimes became powerful enough to assert the power of king also so in this inscription samudragupta is referred to as purush or supreme being who bestows prosperity on the good and destruction on the bad so the gupta rulers what they did was that they were uh, writing down the inscriptions or right, to show the qualities and the power of the king literature coins and inscriptions literature coins and inscriptions helped us in creating history of those days the rule and praise reflect the way of lifestyle and the rule very often poets would also describe the kings all right and they place the kings to a very top position they were treated very very highly superior a good example of the same is hari sena who praised samudragupta the gupta ruler so hari sen he wrote a prashasti okay that is on the alabad pillar which is also known as prayag prashasti now question number 8 to what extent were agriculture practices transformed in the period under consideration so what all changes came so changes here will be talking about the irrigation system new methods of irrigation transplantation system okay and what all technology and equipments were used so now there was increase in the agriculture productivity and it happened because of these reasons use of iron because it is iron age tipped plowshare was used 
flow became common in agricultural activities a new type of agriculture with the help of flow was introduced in the fertile alluvial river valley of ganga and kaveri to enhance its fertility in the areas of high rainfall the use of iron tip flow turned the alluvial soil into high fertile ground so earlier it was made up of wood so the plow plow were wooden tipped but now it is of iron and through this the soil could be turned very easily and faster transplantation pedi transplantation technique was used in which seeds were first broadcast and then the saplings were transplanted to the main field in the water logged areas this ensured higher ratio of survival of saplings and higher yields so dramatically what happened the cultivation of the crop that is rice it increased irrigation was used to increase agricultural productivity through wells tanks and canals artificial form of agriculture farming sorry artificial form of agricultural irrigation was being used communities as well as individuals organized the construction of irrigation works so it was done under the patronage of kings and even at times the individuals they used to organize the funds funds together in the village and they went up with the irrigation projects magadh was the most popular mahajanpat yes we know there were 16 mahajanpats and magadh which is in present day bihar it was the most popular right so we have to examine this statement and we have to justify the how we can say this so now coming on to the answer between the 4th 6th and 4th centuries bce magadh it became the most popular mahajanpat reasons the first is the agricultural prosperity magadh was a region where agriculture was very very productive okay iron mines so there were ample of iron there was no shortage of iron ore so iron ore, iron mines on present jharkhand were accessible and provided resources for tools and weapons elephants they served an important component of army they were found in the forest and they were mainly used for breaking the walls okay the fortified areas the gates communication the ganga and its tributaries provided the means of cheap and convenient communication policies early buddhist and jain writers who wrote about magadh attributed its part to the policies of the individuals means the kings the policies of the kings the kings they were very very progressive in nature so the ambitious kings like bimbisar ajaz shatru and mahapadnand were the best known ones okay along with their ministers capital initially rajgraha was the capital of magadh and later on it was shifted to patliputra Rajgarh was a fortified settlement. It was between the hills, and Patliputra was easily communicable through the Ganga and its tributaries. So the perfect location of the capital was also one of the reason. Nobody could attack them easily. Now, question number ten: What do Ashokan inscriptions tell us about the Mauryans? Describe the limitations of inscriptional evidences. Very important eight marks question. So you all should pin this question to be very important, right? let's come on to the answer ashoka's inscriptions give the following information ashoka was the first ruler who inscribed his messages to his subjects and officials on stone surfaces natural rocks as well as polished pillars all right and he used to do it first preaching dham it included respect towards elders generosity towards brahmins respect for religion and tradition then there were five major political center patliputra Takshila, Ujjaini, Tosali, and Subangiri. According to Ashoka's inscription, the administrative control was strongest in the areas around the capital and the provincial centers. There were five provincial centers. The centers were carefully chosen. Both Takshila and Ujjaini being situated on important long-distance trade routes. Subangiri, it was for gold mines of Karnataka. Now let's talk about the limitations of the inscription evidences: technical, undeciphered, and non-relevant inscription. so technical uh, limitation is that you know these inscriptions are thousands of years old so the letters over the time they have become very faint they are faintly engraved and thus reconstruction is also uncertain inscriptions are at times damaged letters are missing it makes the work of epigraphist more difficult because it is not always easy to be sure about the exact meaning undeciphered inscription there are several thousand inscriptions which have been deciphered which have been discovered but they are not deciphered we are not able to translate read them till date many more inscriptions must have existed which have not survived the ravages of time means they are destroyed non relevant inscriptions not everything that was politically or economically important was recorded in them 
Thus, routine agriculture practices and the joys and sorrows of daily existence find no mention in inscriptions. Means, in the inscriptions, inscriptions were basically issued by the king, so it did not contain much information about the lives of the common people. So that's why these are some of the problems related to inscriptional evidences. Now, what do you mean by numismatics? How has the study of coins helped numismatic numismatists to reconstruct possible commercial networks? Numismatics is the study of the coins. Including visual elements, script, images, metallurgical analysis, context, where they have been found, right? And study of coins has helped numismatists to reconstruct possible commercial network because coins were basically used for trade. Introduction of coinage for trade facilitation. To some extent, exchanges were facilitated, facilitated by the introduction of coinage. Punch marked coins made up of silver and copper, the earliest one. Okay, they were minted and used. These have been recovered from excavations at a number of sites. After this, Kushanas they introduced gold coins and Guptas also came up with gold coins. Kings, merchants and bankers were also issuing authority. They also issued coins. Right, so it speaks about their power. The first coins to bear the names and image of rulers were issued by the Indo-Greeks, who established control over the northwestern part of the subcontinent. Similarity of Kushana coins with those of Greeks and Parthians, the first gold coins were issued in 1st century CE by the Kushana. These were virtually identical in weight with those issued by contemporary Roman emperors and the Parthian rulers of Iran. These coins have been found from several sites in North and Central Asia. Close connections with Roman Empire. The widespread use of gold coins indicates that enormous value of transactions were taking place. Besides, hordes of Roman coins have been found from archaeological sites in South India. It is obvious that network of trade were not confined within political boundaries. South India was not part of Roman Empire, but they were close connections through trade. So, we were associated to Roman Empire right from the ancient time. Right, because we have found several coins of Roman Empire, the silver coins coming to India. And the goods like spices, textiles, they were going to Roman Empire from India. Now moving on to question number 12. Explain the system of land grants and trade from 600 BCE to 600 CE. So we have to explain two things in this particular question. The land grant, that is land grant means when we are giving the land on charity. Okay. And trade, trade of India with other parts of the world. Land grants. From the early centuries, grants of land were made, many of which were recorded in inscriptions. Some of these inscriptions were on stone and some of them were on copper plates. Okay, so they were kept as a record of transaction that who has received land from whom. Grants were given to religious institutions or to the Brahmins. Most of the inscriptions were in Sanskrit. In some cases, especially from 7th century onwards, part of the inscription was in Sanskrit while the rest was in local languages like Tamil or Telugu. According to Sanskrit legal text, women were not allowed to have independent access to resources. But we have seen an exception that is Prabhaviti Gupta, the daughter of Chandragupta, Vikramaditya. She had access to land and even she donated the land to a Brahmin. Okay, that was the village of Daguna which she gave. It is also possible that the provisions of legal tax were not uniformly implemented. The inscriptions also gave us an idea about rural population including Brahmins, peasants and all. Land grants, they also give some insight into the relationship between the cultivators and the state. Okay, however, there were people who were often beyond the reach of officials or salmon, the people like pistolist, fisher, folk and all these people. So, they were the ones from whom the tax could not be collected as they were moving continuously from one place to another. They were not living a settled life. So, the relation between cultivator and state is the same. The cultivator is cultivating the land and giving tax to the state. Second part of this answer, trade. So from 600 BCE to 600 CE, you can find there was trade across India. It was with the neighboring states and even with uh, Roman Empire. From 6th century BCE, land and river both were used okay, to go to Central Asia, to Africa, and even to China, Southeast Asia, and towards Europe. Rulers often attempted to control these routes by offering protection for a price. Means the rulers, they used to charge some tax and uh, they used to 
give protection to the travelers and the merchants all right so that was a kind of protection given to the goods and the merchant those who tra traversed these routes included peddlers who traveled on foot they used to go in caravans bullock carts pack animals they were seafarers the ventures were risky but highly profitable so the goods which were carried they are salt grain cloth metal ore finished goods stone timber medicinal plants spices so they were in great demand in roman empire including textile right so they were transported across the mediterranean sea and arabian sea all the way from arabian sea to mediterranean sea it was moving so this is all about the trade which existed in indian subcontinent and this was one of the reason for the prosperity of our country so dear students here i have covered 12 most important questions of chapter number 2 class class 12th history so i'll be coming with next chapter also chapter number 3 and i'll cover all the 12 chapters in the series so thank you dear students for watching do like share and subscribe and please i'm looking forward for your valuable comments so that we can provide you with the content that you people are actually looking for and also to resolve your doubts right thank you so much once again and all the best for your exams